Welcome to So-and-So, brought to you by Bernina, made to create. I'm Meg Goodman, and you're about to enjoy a casual conversation with a special member of the Sewist and Quilting community. A conversation about how they got started, what inspires them, what excites them, and their connection to this community. Our guest today is Paul Ashworth, CEO of Bernina of America. A marketing and sales professional through experience and grounded in international business and premium brands, he joined Bernina of America 10 years ago as the CEO for North America. Prior to joining Bernina, Paul was in the wine and spirits industry for 20 years, and he states that he is, and I quote, living proof you can drink and sew, end quote. An avowed world traveler, having lived and worked in multiple countries through his journey, He is British by birth, but left England in 1998 for good. Now living in the U.S. since 2005, Paul never graduated from university, opting to travel. He did, however, return to education five years later to complete a master's in business. During his tenure at Bernina of America, he has successfully grown the business over 65%. Bernina of America represents half of Bernina's business worldwide. Paul, welcome to So and So. Thank you, Meg. Looking forward to it. It's good to have you today. You know, um, we've got a, a lot of things to cover. Certainly, many of our listeners um, are very in, invested in Bernina uh, and think very highly of the company. Now, you've had a very successful tenure uh, while at Bernina. What brought you to the company, and and what inspires you, Paul? Thank you. I mean. I guess what brought me to the company, you could say, was luck, like a lot of things in life. Um, I mean, if someone had said to me 11 years ago, oh, you're going to join the sewing industry, I probably would have chuckled to myself. Um, but, you know, I was approached by Bernie of America. I was living in the Chicago area um, to be, you know, their, their new CEO after the uh, prior CEO was retiring after a long tenure, about 15 years. Mm-hmm. And after, as you mentioned, I was 20 years in the wine and spirits industry, and I just had it in my head that that's where I was. But then this came along, and I was like, well, I got, I got a chance to prove to myself that you know I can try and be successful in, in a completely new new industry. And that's that's really what what appealed appealed to me. Um, and obviously, you know, just being a sort of seasoned business person, I always wanted to just sort of you know have that CEO role. And this and Bernie of America gave me that opportunity. So, you know, you, you've run the company for 10 years now, uh, grown at 65%. What, what inspires you on a daily basis? I would say absolutely the passion of this industry and what comes with it. Um, you know, I think I've mentioned or you mentioned, you know, obviously what, what drives a business in, in my head is always the people and the brand. And obviously, we've got a lot of very passionate people, not just in the industry, but obviously within the organization. And as I tell everyone, I mean, if you don't do something with passion, you probably should be changing what you're doing. So um, I wake up every day just thrilled um, to push forward and just continue to um, move us all to a, to a better place and just help the brand be successful and hence the organization. Let's let's talk a little bit. You mentioned that you were in the spirits industry for twenty years. Tell us about that journey and how that prepared you for Bernina. I think what prepared, it prepared me on many levels. Um, you know, obviously, what I, I learned at a very young age before I was in the wine and spirits industry, I spent a little bit of time at financial services, um, and it, it made me realize that I want to be working around things I can relate to. You know, products I can touch, products you can you, know, you can be involved in. I, I I would not be a happy person working in um, what's called it, the service space uh, because you know I, I just believe in brands a lot. And obviously, the spirits industry is it, it, heavily branded um, and a, a lot of development. And I was lucky enough to work across um, three different continents in the wine and spirits industry. Uh, myself being being British. Um, I think I'm, I'm in a very lucky place with the cultural divide that you can get between, say, a European brand and, and, and an American brand. And, and obviously working in the American market, but being able to bring, understand what the Swiss might be thinking, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's my, my, my 
cultural background certainly helps working across different countries. But also in, in America, where I came in 2005, the, the wine and spirits industry is highly regulated, um, not that too dissimilar from you know the pharmaceutical industry to some degree, mm-hmm. but it, it links back to the laws put in place by prohibition, where you have to work. You can't sell direct to the consumer, um, and you can't sell direct to the retailer. You have to go through the wholesale network in the U.S., and every state has its own legislation. Um, Bernina sells exclusively through the our dealer channel. And so that experience with working with wholesalers um, taught me a lot about, you know, um, not what's different from dealerships, but it certainly taught me that, you know, we're not controlling the end sale. Mm-hmm. Someone's doing that for us. So we have to make things executable, uh, easy to understand, so that, our, you know, our, we're only as good as our dealers and how well our dealers uh, bring our brand to life. Uh, so that, that the wholesale network of the wine and spirits industry helped. But also my background in wine and spirits, um, whilst it started with Seagram's, a uh, phenomenal Canadian, you know, American uh, company, I spent the majority of my time with Moet Hennessy, which is part of the Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy group, which obviously focuses very much on premiumness and, and the luxury products. And then in the sewing space, there is nothing more luxurious or premium than the Bernina brand. So mm-hmm. again, that, that gave me a real understanding of how to um, nurture uh, a product to maintain its premiumness and, and not dilute that. And you know, and so much is about the experience, not just the actual physical product. And Bernina is definitely viewed as a a premium ba- brand. Um, I do want to talk about the dealer network a little bit later on, but I, I have to ask you about uh, the quote that, that I mentioned in the uh, introduction. Um, how are you proof that you can drink and sell? And obviously, no pun, no pun intended with the word proof. <laughs> um, but absolutely, I mean, a lot of people ask me, you know, you know, do you miss the wine and spirits industry? And I, I always answer, well, I, I never really left. Um, you know, I'm a bit of a wine wine snob at heart. Um, sometimes, quite often, I'm, I'm, I, I do actually do wine classes for our dealer network um, at our annual convention, or sometimes with our staff, um, because I just you know, wine is all about um, it's all about exploring. Uh, there's there's always another new region or grape or something to try in the area. But absolutely, I just. Um, you know, I was very passionate about the wine and spirits industry, and, I, and I'm very passionate about Bernina. That's been 30 years of my life together. So I still very much bring my wine knowledge or my wine, my passion for wine into, you know, my relationships in, in, in the sewing industry. And you know, like a lot of the dealers who know me know, know, know I have that love for, for a good glass of red wine. I'm sure some of our listeners will be reaching out to you to see what wine pairs well with what they're sewing at the time. So, um, Paul, you, you left um, the UK in 1998 for good, as you say. Why, why did you do that? And where else have you lived and worked? And maybe for good was not the right word because you never know. I might, you know, might end up there one day. Um, but the last time I resided as a taxpaying citizen was in, yes, in 98. Um, I left for the first time in 94, um, where I I moved to uh, Argentina, based in Buenos Aires, uh, seeking organization to launch actually Tropicana Orange Juice at that time in Argentina. Um, But on that first visit to Argentina, um, I met my, you know, what was going to be my wife at that time. And uh, we had our first child. Uh, We came back to England. an opportunity presented itself for me to go back to Argentina in 98. So that's what uh, took me down there. Fortunately, you know, the role I had was very, very international. I, was, I traveled quite a lot back to Europe. I was working for the you know, French group, Louis Vuitton, but Hennessy. So I always kind of kept my roots, my European roots to a certain degree. Um, but then I, you know, through that time in Argentina, I had two more children. So I've got, I've got three girls in total. Um, and then I was um, posted to New York uh, within the Hennessy Group to, to one, run the wine division in the U.S. Uh, and then they eventually moved me out to California here in the U.S. 
Um, and then from California, I moved uh, here to Chicago to be, be with Bernina. And, um, and now I'm uh, have a, have, and now I have a, a second wife who's a California girl um, who was crazy enough to leave San Diego and move to Chicago. But, mm-hmm. um, but that, that's pretty much journey. But I mean, you never know. I mean, I've still got um, 10 more years left in my, well, at least 10 more years left in my professional career. So you never know where it might, might take you as such. Um, so I still have a, a mother living in England. My father's more of a nomad like me. Um, you know, he lived in Australia for 20 years. He's now currently in Florida, but you know, it's, I think home is where the heart is. So uh, I, I'm not too, uh, I'm not sure I'm destined for one, one, one place. Particularly. Now you, you've been in America since 2005, so 16 years, and you've lived, uh, you know, East Coast, West Coast, Midwest. What have you found to be the best parts of America? I, I, it's, uh, there's such a blend, right? I mean, uh, I'm not sure if there is that the perfect spot because America just has so much to offer. Um, New York was a place I always wanted to. I was always drawn to New York. I love the city. Um, I love the energy of it. Um, it can be a little all-encompassing, um, but sometimes you don't realize that until you step away. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, living in California, you know, near the beaches, you know, the weather is just just absolutely outstanding. But then. You know, I thought I thought New York New York was the expensive place to live until I moved to Southern California. Um, and then you come to someone here like Chicago that yes, um, it's phenomenal for six months of the year. It's, it's a little tough for the other six months of the year, but the people um, you know just around the city of Chicago are just you know, it's just a joy to be with. You know, everyone talks about the Midwest values. It's, it's so true. So I mean, then obviously I've never. Live, let's say in the southern parts, um, but I mean, I love. You know, I've, I've been lucky enough with Bernina to pretty much visit every state uh, in the U.S. It's a couple I've not got into, which is Alaska, uh, Arkansas. Uh, but I've not been up to Vermont yet. Um, but mm-hmm. you know, I've been, you know, there's there's, there's there's so much to offer. There's nooks and crannies everywhere, and. Whilst I love to travel internationally, I mean, I, I enjoy getting to new spots within the U.S. And, you know, my wife is always rather embarrassed that I know America better than her. Because, you know, I'm, I'm just getting into some of these um, diverse corners, which is which is where a lot of our Bernina dealers are. You know, Bernina dealers aren't anchored in the main metro areas. They're all they're a lot more rural or tend to be destinations than in the major cities. So it'd be very hard for me to pick one particular place. Um, you know, yeah, I know my, my wife is drawn very much to the, the southeast. That old, she's a she's a film fanatic and she loves Gone with the Wind. So, mm-hmm. and I know I know if she if she was to live somewhere, she'd want to be down there in the South Carolina, Georgia area. But I guess we'll figure it out one day in the future. Now, where where have you yet to travel that's important to you to visit one day? Uh, a couple of places, you know. I've, Obviously, Europe I know extensively well um, through obviously living in Europe and everything's in such close proximity. So you can do all that. And I, obviously, I go back you know, probably three, four times a year with, with Bernina. So often we'll add on trips because this is nice. You know, obviously, to, 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 to my wife, Hope, who knows Europe also very well. Um, I've lived in South America. I still have daughters um, that live in Argentina. Obviously, the US I know well. The area I know the least in the world is uh, is Asia. Um, whilst I've gone to Asia a few times, uh, business I've never extensively traveled through you know, places like India or China. So there are definitely gaps for me. Australia and New Zealand that I know. Um, I think though, if, was, if there's one place that's really re- I'm really keen to go to in the next couple of years, it's actually Istanbul. Mm-hmm. I've always had a passion to go to to go to Turkey. Um, you know, it's always referred to as the sort of a melting pot. It's where the East meets the West, mm-hmm. uh, both you know uh, geographically and religiously. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to go to to a, um, a Nile cruise about three four years ago. I had time in Cairo just to, to know those cultures a bit better. And that's so I think Turkey. You know, and a little Turkey, then maybe a little a little a cruise. To Greece from there through the islands would be that'd be probably my 
perfect next trip. But, uh, but yeah, Asia is definitely part of the world. I'm not, I don't know too much yet. So several great opportunities for new adventures. Paul, something that, that is uh, something that you say about Bernina is that Bernina on the outside means Bernina on the inside. Can you explain that to us? Absolutely. And it's, it's really part of uh, the brand and the company's DNA. When we say Bernina, a product has Bernina on it, it means we are making it. We are controlling every step of the uh, production, manufacturing, sourcing, processing. And it's made in our own production facilities, um, which is fairly unique in this uh, in the sewing industry. A lot of our competitors do some do make their own products, but they don't make them across every segment they compete in. Um, you know, we've added new business segments like long arms, and, um, high end um, air threading surges. I mean, these, these were capabilities we've built in house and now manufacture in our own facilities. We don't, we don't outsource that to anyone else. We, mm -hmm. we do as a company have a second brand called Burnett, which is a more of an entry level, more accessible product. Um, and that, whilst it's made for us, is made for us by other people. And hence it has a different brand name um, and obviously kind of a different price point focus. But, you know, Burnett is a made to last, the high quality. Um, you know that the, the, their housing, or let's say their chassis inside, is, you know, is uh, is steel or aluminum, and they're really robust. So when, when you ever get a chance to take off the covers off a of Bernina, and you see what is inside, if you ever compare that to a competitive product, um, it's really sort of sort of night and day. So it's really representing very much our philosophy in terms of quality, um, manufacturing, engineering, performance. And of course, you know, all, 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 all done in-house and you know, developed in-house. It's, uh, it's interesting, as we've talked to several of our guests on uh, this podcast, um, they have not entered the market with Bernina, but they always aspired to Bernina and found it uh, a sense of accomplishment when they were able to um, uh, buy one of the machines. And once they've owned Bernina, they don't only just own one. Is that, is that pretty common? It's very common. It's it's not typical that Bernina is your first sewing machine. It, it can happen because maybe you um you know you were, you were given one by to a family member or you were exposed to it. But you know Bernina is unfortunately a, a not inexpensive. Uh, obviously, we you know we're, we're based out of Switzerland, which is you know, a fairly high cost base for the product. But obviously, as I said you know we're doing everything in house. Um, so, you know, most people who want to get an entry level machine typically start somewhere else. Um, but they, they know, you know, or they've become aware that Bernina is reputed to be the best. And then once they, you know, you get into that, of course, you know, one's never enough. Um, and it's probably last for so long, but, you know, Bernina is very much about stitch, stitch quality. Um, it's a bit of an obsession. Um, and so that's really when people really see the difference. I and mean, once you sew on a Bernina, you 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 you, you hear and feel see the difference immediately. Immediate. And you've really got to have that experience on the Bernina to realize that, you know, that difference. Paul is is a, a leader of your company. You say that success is driven through two forces: people and brand strength, both of which need nurturing. Why these two forces, and how do you nurture them? Absolutely, and of course, obviously. That's, you know, taking it to its very simplest level. Um, there's so many things that are required um, to make a brand strong or to have the right team. But ultimately, if you don't have the right people doing the right things and you have no brand strength or brand awareness or um, identity, brand identity, you, you, you're going to fail. There's other reasons a business can fail, such as, you know, cash flow, bad strategy. But ultimately, you know, if you don't have good people doing the right stuff and, and a strong brand, um, you, you're not, you're not going to get very far. Um, so the nurturing side is really about, you know, where do I spend my time and effort and focus? And, um, I would say at least 30% of my, my time is, is involved in the people, um, that are, you know, making this organization successful, uh, you know, making sure 
everyone knows what everyone's doing. We all have common goals, heading the right direction. Uh, you know, usually talent is is, is is abundant, but is that talent being used appropriately? Is, is it? Are we are we matching people up to be successful? Because you could have great talent for people, but they're doing the wrong thing. And so it becomes you know, a challenge. So as, as the organization grows, obviously, you know, your, your, your employee base grows. You just want to keep maintaining the right kind of culture and direction. In terms of brand strength, you now I was very fortunate to inherit an organization in which, you know, the Bernina brand had a lot of strength. But of course, we want to nurture that. Um, and you want to make sure that you know, we're treating it the right way. And obviously, our partners, our, our dealers, are also representing the brand in, in, in the correct manner. You know, obviously, they provide a lot, a lot of service, and so we have to help you know, make sure that they're educated and have all the tools. So it's just an ongoing, continual um, balancing act to a certain degree. But if we get those two big things right, which takes, obviously, lots of small things, um, you know, I believe we can continue to be very successful. Now, you, you mentioned that 30% of your time uh, is invested in the people of Bernina. And Bernina stands for, in, in your, your brand, stands for quality, innovation, and performance. So how do you and your team walk this talk? That's a good question. Um, obviously, so as a premium brand also, it, it's very important that all the touch points that the consumer has with Bernina represent those things but especially the quality aspect so if, if the brand is representing quality it means everything the consumer does around the brand needs to be perceived as quality as well so if we're creating for example a simple uh, brochure about a product you know you want to make sure it's done with the right paper stock that so that touch and feel you know, it doesn't seem cheap it's that representing quality as well you know our website needs to be of the best possible experience uh, the education that the consumer receives, be it through our webinars or, or from the dealer, obviously needs to be outstanding. So you know, that's how we, we try to keep constantly keep the quality perception of this as high as possible. Innovation absolutely comes from trying to develop new products, um, new products that consumers don't, need, don't even realize they need yet, uh, you know, allowing our consumers to um, enhance their creativity or unleash their creativity with, with, with the Bernina product. And obviously just always looking at different ways to do things. And that's not just with the product. It could be about how we communicate with consumers, um, maybe how we even bring a, a promotional activity to life or how they find us in different different spots. But just innovation is, you know, it's an endless thing. And then performance obviously is heavily linked to, to the product. So, we want to make sure that obviously products put into the marketplace uh, obviously are well performing, um, have the minimum amount of uh, errors. And um, obviously, we're not 100% perfect in that in that space. Uh, you know, there's a typical burning in a sewing machine has a has a hundred sorry 1,000 components that you know make up the machine. So 1,000 know, components potentially, yeah. So you can get you know if one po- if one piece is out of out of spec, you know it can have major consequences. So there's, there's a lot of uh, constant testing. In fact, at the head factory, they have 20 people just there that are in the, in the consumer labs just testing products or post-testing equipment. We have our own technical team here on site uh, where sometimes we will check uh, spot check machines before they go out or just help support our dealer network on technical questions, etc. And, and our education team is, is actually my biggest department. Uh, and all, all these things just add in just to make sure we can provide the best performance possible for these machines. You know, you said um, when you were talking about innovation um, that you created some things for people that they didn't even know they needed yet. And and there's a, a famous quote that Henry Ford said that if he asked people what they initially wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So in in that vein, how do you get an idea of where to go next? And that that's always the um, one of the biggest challenges, you know, with, with research and development or engineering. Uh, it's really trying to find those insights because it's very difficult for someone to describe something they want if they don't know it exists. Uh, so you're trying to find things that will create 
So if we can identify techniques or, or products that are going to make people um, do what they do better, then we, we believe there's going to be a good good performance for that. But it's obviously a lot of it comes from listening and understanding what maybe are the um, uh, the pain points for consumers in the in the projects they're making. What do they need? Or you know they don't know what they need, but they describe um, where they're struggling with certain areas. It can help us, you know, potentially you know, formulate something. We have a, we have over 100 uh, presser feet in the Bernina family, uh, and it always feels like we never have enough presser feet. So there's always you know so many different little techniques, and each one of these feet just help people enhance certain certain areas. And you mentioned earlier about you know people owning multiple Bernina machines, which is difficult. Mm-hmm. I mean, Bernina lovers typically just adore their feet. Um, and they have a, a constant array of, of feet because there's, there's so many different feet that help certain different techniques. I think that's, that's a good example. You know, we wouldn't have that many feet if we weren't constantly uh, listening to our consumers and trying to make their, um, their sewing easier for them. You know, you, you're talking about the, the touch points. And earlier in our conversation, we were talking about your dealer network and you call them phenomenal. What's the role of this dealer network to Bernina? It's essential. Um, you know, we 100% of our sales go through our dealer network. Um, whilst we do have a, an online presence, it still drives everything back to the dealer. Uh, we need the dealer. And to a certain degree, the, the dealer needs us. Um, a good portion of our dealers are just selling the Bernina brand. And there's another half that's, you know, selling multiple brands. But, you know, so it, it's, it's almost like... Um, it's almost like a marriage, but without um, without a ring to a certain degree. Um, you know, if, if, if our dealer network is not being successful, there's absolutely no chance for the Bernina organization to be successful, and, and, and vice versa. So this is this is um, there's this love of each other, uh, which is obviously, but obviously they're an independent business just like we are, um, and, and it's not always. You know, we can't make a decision based on what's best for all the dealers because that, that's near impossible due to the diversity. Uh, we have dealers that are just machine focused. We have ones that have quilt stores. We have ones that sell vacuums as well. You know, you've got all these different variables. But as I said, you know, we want our dealers to be as successful as possible because then that, that translates into Bernina of America being as successful as possible. Paul, you've said that you very much want to make sewing more inclusive. What does this look like? It's trying to get you know more and more people aware that sewing still exists. Um, I've sometimes referred to you know talking to our dealers. You know, sewing sometimes feels like a cult. It's like you know once people are in and they're, and they're in, boy, they are in. I mean, they mm-hmm. are passionate. They love it. They have multiple machines. They can't get enough of it. It becomes a community for them. Um, but it seems sometimes we're keeping some folks out and we need to do a, a, a better a better job of that. Um, and that's not just the role of Bernina, it's the role of the industry. Um, when I say the industry, not just the manufacturers of sewing machines, but our dealers, um, the fabric companies, the notion companies, you know, collectively we all coexist. And uh, the success of the mach- machine manufacturers to sell more machines obviously supports the whole um, ecosystem of you know, selling more fabric and all the other things. Um, part of the challenge in the U.S. is you know sewing is not part of the school curriculums anymore. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the Bernie and sewers today, um, who might be close to retirement age, they typically got their first experience on a sewing machine at the school, mm-hmm. and that's that's kind of gone away. Um, not in all areas of the U.S. Um, there is still school business in some areas, but it's, it's by and by kind of disappeared. Um, so hence, we're always looking for that next generation. You know, how can you reach um, those new set of crafters and so that people become more aware? You know, I've often, you know, when people ask me what I do, um, you know, I get one of two responses. It's either people still, you know, the question is, do people still sew? Or the other response is, oh my gosh, 
I know someone who knows a foot and knee or anything. So there's no sort of mid midpoint. Mm-hmm. Like people are mm-hmm. completely know about everything, or they're completely, completely oblivious to that, 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 that it exists. So, and we want to just, I don't think sewing will ever become necessarily a mainstream, but obviously crafting is a mainstream, you know, um, hobby. And so you know, we, just, we just need to sort of try and you know, branch out more. Um, I, don't, I don't want to say unfortunately, but you know, COVID has certainly um, really helped the industry tremendously in the sense that it, it's brought people back to sewing a lot more. Uh, at the beginning of COVID, obviously the mass construction, be it for yourself or doing it for the um, first responders, was, was a major wave of activity, which you know, I think got a lot of people um, aware of sewing machines again, or had past sewers, you know, go find those old machines and, and get them back out again. So that, that, mm-hmm. that's a good example of how, um, unfortunately, through a crisis, um, how I think sewing is certainly become, becoming a little, little more inclusive and less exclusive. Does, does Bernina have um, specific steps that you're taking to increase this um, inclusivity? Are, are there uh, initiatives um, that you have out in the marketplace um, that you've found to be successful? Yes, um, several things. I mean, obviously, one is one of the first, actually, is just you know, the role of diversity, um, trying to get more into uh, more diverse groups or get you know in connecting with more you know the other community root level. Um, we still continue to support schools. We've also made um, a lot of efforts to support uh, the arts arts institutes, you know, like theatres and everything, because they're always making costumes or their play productions. You know, obviously, and Bernina has that ability to sew through heavy fabric. So there's always an annual convention of. Uh, the theatres um, that moves around the US, which you try to participate in. Um, cosplay is another thing. A lot of people, again, making costumes um, against you know, these, these famous characters that uh, inspire them. Obviously, uh, those people, if someone's a cosplayer, they're usually extremely passionate. And we've been attending those conventions around the US as well. Um, so these are areas where we're trying to get to this next generation of sewers. Paul, oh, what's next for Bernina? Uh, Organization-wise, obviously, the key key objective is to maintain our you know, our financial strength and, and growth, uh, support our dealer network, so we can continue to be you know, just just as, as successful as, as, as possible. Uh, on the product side, I mean, we've pretty much filled you know the last five years we've entered into the long arm sewing and uh, the high end overlocker business with our air threader. So. Those were two gaps. You know, we're we're now the only company, sewing manufacturer, that actually that plays in every sort of segment that that exists per se. Because you've got embroidery as well, and obviously sewing, uh, software, and all all these kind of things. So Mm -hmm. we've we've kind of we're in every segment. The key thing now is obviously just to keep, you know, upgrading our machines, uh, and you know, and bringing new features and, and new benefits. Um, I mean, there's no one massive area we need to get into. And obviously, uh, I think the role of Wi-Fi will certainly become far more important in machines. Um, you know, bringing that technology, uh, not just to high-end machines, but to entry-level machines as well. Uh, the development of then, obviously, apps to support um, that Wi-Fi connectivity will be important. Because uh, there's not a lot you can, you know, from an engineering standpoint, you know, the sewing machine is pretty much I don't say set, but I mean, it, 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 the, the mechanics are, you know, haven't changed that much. You know, the real advancements now come with this called it the operating system um, that, that, that runs it, uh, gives it the heartbeat and such. Um, I mean, that's where, that's where the future development will come more from the sort of this called it the, the inner software, uh, and just trying to make these machines you know, easier and easier to use as we keep adding more and more, you know, uh, strong features. You know, it's, um, it's interesting that, that people react to you and say, well, do people still sew? And through this podcast, we've met so many people of varying genders and races and, and fabric artists and, and quilters and, and, and just the stories of connection and community. Um, Bernina has been a, a very big part of, 
just building this connection uh, through COVID, uh, especially uh, many people mentioned that um, sewing got them through the the tough times or changed their life or or became more inclusive for them. Uh, so it seems like there's a, a lot of opportunity out there. Now, now we've talked about a lot of things, Paul. And um, my last question for you is, what question didn't I ask you that you wish I had? Well, one thing that jumps to my mind and we didn't really talk about um, Bernina, and obviously it's, it's, it's a family-owned business, uh, fourth generation, uh, Hans-Peter Orchie is chairman of the company. Um, who's you know, obviously been around Bernina Brand all, all his life. And his two children are now involved in the business as well. So the fifth generation is there. But I, I think the fact that we're a family business is, is, is absolutely part of our DNA. All our dealer network are, are family owned businesses. So it, it creates a nice, nice harmony. And, you know, I, I spent, you know, 20 years of my professional life, if not more, working in multi internationals, public companies. You know, I see the decisions that the chairman makes, and it's it's all about him leaving this business as strong as he can for his children. Um, it's not about how quickly do I get a return or something I'm doing. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have done things like you know, uh, long arms and, and, and getting into overlockers. And I think that, that just being a family company is, is absolutely something I'm very proud to be part of, and it gives us our, our longevity. I think the one thing um, I was with the, the, the chairman last week. Uh, it was the first time he came to the US in two years. Was able to come, but he, he talks about Bernie and being a love a love brand. Mm-hmm. And I think he's, he's absolutely right. I think consumers who have Bernina, it becomes a love affair. No doubt about it. It's a high engagement. There's a high level of um, uh, just connect, connection with the brand. Um, and that's really you know, something that he's nurtured over the you know the forty years of his professional career um, in the organization. And it's just, so there's one thing I'd like to say: it's just, just those, those the aspects of it. Our, our family ownership makes us very uh, very special. And and it seems, Paul, through all you've shared with us today, that 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 family nature of the company that starts at the top permeates all levels of the companies, the dealers, and uh, into those who own Bernina. Paul, this has been a wonderful conversation. I want to thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. If any of our listeners would like to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do so? Um, Multiple ways. Um, But obviously the easiest way would be through my email, which is, you know, uh, pashworth uh, at berninausa.com. Additionally, if you go to our website, bernina.com, there is a contact contact us um, query section. It could be about a product or whatever, but we, um, we have a person dedicated to, to viewing that and answering questions. So that way, also things could be, could be forwarded on to me. Or just call us here in uh, Chicago. Um, I cannot remember for the life of me what the phone number is. <laughs> none of none of us actually have to remember phone numbers anymore. It's just, it's just we just hit a button. But uh, you know, if you Google Bernie of America, um, the number will come up pretty quickly on, on a Google search. That's great, Paul. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, May. Have a great day. Well, there you have it. Another story about someone just like you, someone for whom sewing and quilting is a connection to something bigger. If you know someone you think has an outstanding story, a story that should be shared on this podcast, please drop me a note to info at soandsopodcast.com or complete the form on our website. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite platform and visit our website, soandsopodcast.com for more information about today's and all of our guests. That's S-E-W-A-N-D-S-O podcast.com. And finally, I'd like to thank Bernina for making this program possible. I'm Meg Goodman, and I look forward to you joining us next time on So-and-So.